Today on Ag Etc., we talk with Dr. Romulo Lolato from K-State's Department of Agronomy and about this year's wheat crop. He talks about what factors from the fall and the spring are having the biggest impact on wheat fields across the state. He also talks about what K-State Research and Extension is doing to get information out to farmers during COVID-19. Next, meet Maddox Small, this week's Young Leader in Ag. Then learn about research showing how cattle genetics is targeting immunity, where one day cattle will never be sick. It's all coming up on Ag Etc. Stay tuned. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com. In the middle of this current challenge, that mission remains unchanged. Our promise has always been to provide relevant, science-based education and information to help you make decisions to maintain and improve your health, build and sustain businesses, grow your community, steward resources, and raise the next generation of capable, responsible, thoughtful community leaders. This segment brought to you by SureCrop, liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. I'm Britton Rucker and this is Ag AM in Kansas. Today for the wheat update, I have Romulo Lolato, wheat and forage extension specialist from Kansas State University. Romulo, kind of give us a quick update of the wheat season in general. Hi, and yeah, thanks for having me on air here today. Uh, Overall, the wheat season in Kansas, uh, it, it has started with a few challenges back last fall, right? We remember back uh, in the fall, we had a few pockets around the state where we were actually quite dry. And that specifically refers to southwest part of the state and pockets, parts of central Kansas as well, right? In those specific regions, the wheat didn't really come up until the spring, right? It was so dry in the fall that uh, regardless of planting day, uh, the, the actual emergence date on those parts of the state was actually quite late. It was not until probably January that the, the wheat came up on those parts of the state. In the remaining, uh, so central Kansas, north central Kansas, uh, northwest Kansas as well, uh, we had two different situations, right? Either the crop that got planted um, on time, uh, either after a long fallow period or a, 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 not a, pre a previous wheat crop or a canola crop, uh, those fields got planted on time and they had a very good development in the fall. Uh, and we had those crops that got planted after a summer crop. So most of central Kansas, we have a lot of, a lot of soybeans uh, and that pushes the sowing date of the wheat a little bit later. Uh, and in western Kansas, we saw a, a very large increase in corn acres. And that also in western Kansas pushed the wheat planting dates later. So essentially we have these three situations, right? The crop that never emerged until the spring, a crop that was planted on time and had a good development, and a crop that actually uh, was waiting on a summer crop to be harvested until it went in. Now that's important because those crops are in different stages of development right now, right? The, the crop that emerged early was more advanced. Uh, parts of the state that we were already seeing probably in between the first and the second node showing up now in, in, in the mid part of April. Um, the late planted crop was more likely reaching that first node now. Of course, this depends where we are in the state. And that crop didn't come up until the spring, likely still going through that tiller stage, so a little bit behind in, in development. During this time of the state uh, of the year as well, we, we're starting to see uh, some yellow wheat showing up, and that yellow can have several different causes, right? And it's quite normal during this time of the year. Some of those causes can be related to fertility, uh, nitrogen or sulfur deficiency. We can also see some early season diseases like uh, like dense spot or septoria showing up. Um, 
route restrictions and things along those lines as well. So, so that's an overview of the state. Moisture-wise, uh, we are relatively in good shape, or at least I should say that we were until probably that late March, early April time frame. Overall, uh, uh, the crop had, didn't really suffer with, with much drought other than those two pockets that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, now we're probably starting to need some moisture again. The, the wheat crop uses quite a bit of water uh, during this phase of development, and so we're starting to, to, to we could use some, some, some rainfall uh, in parts of the state at this moment. We will continue with our wheat update with Romulo after the break. Kansas Farm Bureau has served farm families and rural Kansas for more than 100 years, and we're pleased to offer new health care coverage choices for Kansans in 2020 through Kansas Farm Bureau Health Plans. No matter what stage of life you're in, we'll have options that fit your lifestyle. Plus, our network of providers is one of the largest available throughout the state of Kansas and beyond. For more information, including the different plans available, or to get a quote, visit kfbhealthplans.com. Welcome to the Western Kansas Wildlife Travel Center right here in my hometown of Oakley, Kansas. We're the front door of Western Kansas, located on three main highways, I-70, US-83, and US-40. And all those roads lead to history, beautiful scenery, and adventure, no matter which direction you go. We now have an IHOP. That brand that you've trusted up and down the road in all your travels is staffed with local folks, real people, just like you and me, and we're waiting on you to join us. So for fun, adventure, fuel up, fuel your body, and let's have some fun. I'm Bob Swartz. And I've devoted the last 43 years to helping Kansans reach their retirement goals and to protect the family farm. At Bob Swartz Financial, we believe everyone should be able to live the retirement they've always dreamed of. Our team of professionals can help you create an efficient strategy using a variety of investment vehicles to help you address your financial needs and your concerns. Bob Swartz Financial values, commitment, and transparency. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment brought to you by Kansas Wheat. Learn more at rediscoverwheat.org. Now, I'm sure a lot of producers are wondering what the recent low temperatures are doing to the wheat. That's definitely a huge concern with wheat growers throughout the state. And, uh, we have had actually three different cold spells this far. One was in late March. Uh, the crop was probably uh, small enough that that one uh, might not have hurt us. We had the second one in the early part of April. Uh, and then we had a third one that was just now uh, in on Good Friday, just before Easter. And that was likely uh, one of the most uh, dangerous ones. So, so what are the three things that we need to consider when it comes to freeze damage on wheat? Number one, how cold did it get, right? That's, that's the one factor that we need to consider. The second factor is for how long were temperatures at damaging uh, thresholds or below damaging threshold to the crop. And the third one is how far along is the crop? The stage of development of the wheat crop is actually very important because different phases of the development of the crop have different thresholds uh, to cold temperature. So for example, a crop that is pillaring, uh, it might handle temperatures down to 12 degrees quite well. A crop that is jointing, that has already the first uh, node appearing, well, if we get to the low 20s, if we get below, below 24, 25, that can already cause some damage. And as the crop progresses towards and pieces, so the second node, perhaps the third node, and, and boot stage, and so on, it gets more and more sensitive so that 32 degrees can cause damage when the crop is flowering. So uh, with these three different uh, freezes that we had, probably the region that would be more exposed to cold damage would have been uh, parts of central Kansas uh, in a crop that was 
planted early. Remember that we have three different stages of the crop. So those fields that were planted early, uh, they were bigger and more developed. So they were more sensitive to cold temperatures as well. Uh, in those fields, we might actually see some level of damage. And um, the, the fields that were behind the development as compared to uh, those at least, they might have dodged that bullet, mostly because they're not as sensitive to cold temperatures, right? So the, probably the biggest concern would be central Kansas, parts of south central Kansas. So as we get to, for example, uh, Stafford County or lower uh, Pratt, Pratt County or something along those lines. Uh, that transition region where uh, the crop was already uh, advanced enough it could suffer some, some, some cold temperatures, some damage from the cold temperatures. Um, because below that, though the crop might have been more advanced, temperatures didn't get as cold. As we get, for example, to Sumner County, uh, the crop would probably have been further along than what we had in in, in Pratt or Stafford County, but then temperatures were not as cold. So this time of the year is very challenging. Uh, I think we will see some damage to the wheat crop this year, and that damage can have different facets here, right? So um, the primary heads, which are the more developed, they're in, in those more advanced fields, there's a very high chance that they're probably going to perish and they're not going to be there anymore. If we have weather conditions now that are conducive for uh, bouncing back of the crops for, for a regrowth and of the crop like moisture and cool temperatures that can still be pretty helpful and we might end up with a with a very decent crop even in those fields that got damaged by by the cold now if it turns out to continue to to, to dry out and temperatures warm up for example uh, then those fields uh, are like likely going to have very low yield levels and producers are probably going to look into terminating some of those fields. So definitely a uh, widespread concern, South Central Kansas, Central Kansas as well, perhaps those fields in Southwest Kansas that emerged early as well. Uh, the ones that didn't emerge until the spring, they're probably more protected because they are behind in development. So definitely some concerns out there, definitely some producers are likely losing some sleep now, but I'd like to remember them there's nothing they can do right away. The best thing to do right now is to wait a few days after that cold spell, right? Give it a week, uh, give it some warm temperatures, and then go out and check for, uh, for any symptoms, right? And, and what they should really be checking for would include new leaves coming out from the world. So if those new leaves are nice and green, there's a pretty good indication that that healer is alive. If, that, if those leaves are, are yellow, there's a high chance that that healer is probably gone. Uh, also, uh, looking for those main stems, picking them out, splitting them lengthwise, and looking for that developing head. If that developing head is nice and green and turgid, uh, crispy, then it's a good sign. If that developing head is yellow and, and mushy and you can really tell that it, it, it's, it's gone, then probably that healer is not going to produce any, any grain. When we come back, learn how K-State Extension is keeping you informed during COVID-19. Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business has started in the 80s. We predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. Based out of Seneca, Kansas, we work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need, and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results, and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm, so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's that's very efficient to them and, and works well on their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but yet we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is surecropfertilizers.com. And you can always email me at corey at surecropfertilizers.com. And with any questions you have, we'll be glad to answer it and work with you. Kansas Corn reminds you that E15 fuel is the right choice for every kind of driver. For the car enthusiast, E15 has higher octane. For the thrifty driver, E15 is priced lower than regular unleaded. For the nature lover, E15 provides cleaner air. For the shopper who buys local, E15 has more ethanol from our Kansas corn farms. Choose E15 for a higher octane, lower price, cleaner American fuel. 
Message from the Kansas Corn Commission. Learn more at kscorn.com. This segment brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff. Progress powered by Kansas farmers. I'm sure that much like the rest of us, your life has changed drastically due to COVID-19. How has the extension plans and research platforms changed because of this COVID-19? Yes, it definitely changed considerably, right? We, we are uh, following the state guidelines as far as um, working from home right now. Uh, some of the research continues, right? So agriculture is deemed as essential. And so the, the research continues, especially the ones that have already been started back in the fall. Now that is continuing under a limited activity status, right? So we're just going out for a very, very essential type of measurements that we have to take in the growing season. We're following social distancing guidelines, such as driving different vehicles and, and trying to maintain at least uh, uh, six feet distance from each other and things along these lines. But we're really just doing the very essential things in the research side. Now, the extension plans, they, they drastically change it because extension is being out there and having that contact with the grower, right? And K-State issued a statement that we're not going to have any in-person meetings until July 4th, at least. And uh, the, the time period between May 10th through June 15th is usually when we have 60, 70, 75 plot tours with variety plot tours around the state. So we're, we're coming up with different plans to tackle that. Uh, we are going to make sure that producers have the information they need to uh, to make a good variety selection for last fall. But that's going to look a little bit different this year. Uh, we're going to probably do a few live plot tours where we go to locations where we have uh, uh, several varieties and we can discuss them. So we're probably also going to, to have the information out as short variety videos uh, for, for the growers to be able to just access that on their own time and, and try to learn from our perspective uh, on each one of those different varieties. It's a very important time for wheat right now. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot be out there face to face with growers, but we will make sure that we continue that contact with them, even though that might look a little bit different this year. Well, Romulo, a big thank you for a quick wheat update, and I wish you well in these crazy changing times. Well, thank you, Britton. I, I, I wish you the same. Stay safe, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. I'm Britton Rucker, and this has been Ag AM in Kansas. Okay, looks like it's time for our tour. Welcome to the Fort Wallace Museum. Here at the museum, you're gonna find some really interesting stuff like our replica stagecoach from the Butterfield Overland Dispatch. We've got facades from the fort buildings. We've got an 1870s flag. There's a plesiosaur that was discovered locally. We've got the Ray pump organ collection. We're a little bee place with a great big story and we'd love to have you. What if U.S. soybean meal were more than a commodity? If seed companies and the soybean checkoff built a better variety? That future is here. The time is now. To meet end-user demands, the soybean checkoff is investing in the compositional quality of soybeans, including meal. A message from the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. This segment brought to you by Farm Credit Associations of Kansas, lending support to rural America, and by American Ag Service, your DuPont Pioneer dealer. I'm Britton Rucker, and this is our Young Leaders in Ag segment. I'm with Maddox Small from Neotishay, Kansas. Maddox, tell me a little bit about your background and your farming experience. So I have been on a farm and we raise cattle and farm corn, soybeans, and wheat. Um, I have been in 4-H and shown cattle, sheep, been in crops, woodworking, baking, and arts and crafts. And if I were to do this for 
my technology or space, this would be my first year in that. Very good. So Maddox, I'm sure your learning has changed drastically since COVID-19. Kind of go into what that looks like on a day-to-day basis now. My classes, um, we are using Google Classroom and we have four days of work posted on Google Classroom and there's about I'd say three hours per day. Yeah. So there's really time to get outside and do some of your farming. Yes. Now, what has been some challenges associated with going to this new way of learning? Not having teachers to interact with and organization. Well, Maddox, you came up with a cool idea of printing 3D ear savers for people to help alleviate pressure on their ears from wearing masks all day due to COVID-19. Yes. How did you come up with that idea? Facebook. (laughs) And my 3D printer was too small for face shields. So I was looking for something and it was small enough. And it's about six inches long by half inch wide. And you put your mask elastic around the hooks and then put it on like so. Very good. So it doesn't even go around the ears. No. It can, but it doesn't rub the back of the ears raw. So Now, Maddox, are you passing these out to the public or your community? Yes, I am. And I am constantly printing these. Yeah. So how many of these do you print a day? Depends on how much work we have because they take about 20 minutes a piece and Sometimes we're out of the house about two hours at a time and we're not back. And the plastic of the PLA is made of parts of it are made out of corn. So also supporting ag community. Where do you see yourself going in the future? Say probably John Deere, engineer, aerospace, something like that. Well, you have a good start with coming up with those ear savers. Well, a big thank you to Maddox Small for being on our Young Leaders in Ag segment. I'm Britton Rucker, and this has been Ag AM in Kansas. At Farm Credit, we partner with America's farmers who work hard each and every day to grow the food that we all enjoy. It's not an easy task, but it's an important one. Farm Credit is proud to work with farmers and ranchers, lending support in rural America. Highways 40, 83, and I-70 come together right here in Oakley. Roads that lead to businesses, to magnificent rock formations, to scenic vistas, to places where legends were made. Roads that lead us home. Discover Oakley, the gateway to western Kansas. The Kansas Wheat Innovation Center in Manhattan is rediscovering ways to get improved varieties and new genetics in the hands of farmers faster. Grower-led and checkoff-funded research initiatives are bringing about positive change. This grassroots leadership provides a strong voice in Topeka and Washington, D.C. Now is the time to partner with Kansas Wheat in moving wheat forward. Kansas Wheat Commission and Kansas Association of Wheat Growers, farmers investing in their future and yours. Log on to rediscoverwheat.org. This segment brought to you by Santa Fe Trail Meats in Overbrook. Let us help feed your family. Imagine a world where you could breed cattle that never get sick. It's not as far off as you might think. Ongoing research across two continents is uncovering genetic tools to help select for increased immunity. 
It's really easy to assume that when you're selecting the most productive animals that they are also the ones with the most robust immune system because people think, okay, to get, you know, to be productive, you need to have obviously not been too, too much affected by health issues. But the research tells us that it is actually, if we select for productivity alone, we increase susceptibility to disease. Hines says it's time for cattlemen to rethink that bias for themselves and for the greater beef community. I think there's obvious benefits for producers economically from breeding for improved immune competence, but I think the big benefit is, is in our, you know, maintaining consumer confidence in, in beef, um, that they know that we're working towards. And we, we all know that we've been working towards it, it's just giving people the tools to do that. The want to work towards better health and welfare has always been there. It's just, it's providing tools to allow that to happen um, is what we're trying to achieve. The American Angus Association, along with Canadian scientists, plans to collaborate with the Australians to make advances in the ways cattlemen create healthy herds. Antibiotics have been the best tool, but genomic tools could let cattlemen create immunity in their herds, an important step in light of legislative and consumer concerns. Antibiotics have allowed us in some ways to have a band-aid over the problem for a while. Um, but that band-aid is being removed. So we need to be ready for when that band-aid's removed. And a, and a really good strategy is to, is to try and breed animals that have improved disease resistance. They don't get infected with diseases often, and so we don't require the same amount of antibiotics to treat them. It's no magic solution that replaces good husbandry. Instead, they work in concert. Obviously, genetic, the, the genetic approach is just one part of the story. If we really want to make a difference, we have to think about reducing environmental load of, of pathogens in our production systems. We can breed the animals that are the most disease resistant, but if we put them in a, in a really um, bad, high disease risk environment, then you know, they will eventually succumb to disease. So, so that's important. The research project is underway with hopes of eventually giving cattlemen new genetic tools, such as an expected progeny difference or a genomic test for immunity. I'm Bob Cervera. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com. Kansas Farm Bureau has served farm families and rural Kansas for more than 100 years, and we're pleased to offer new health care coverage choices for Kansans in 2020 through Kansas Farm Bureau Health Plans. No matter what stage of life you're in, we'll have options that fit your lifestyle. Plus, our network of providers is one of the largest available throughout the state of Kansas and beyond. For more information, including the different plans available, or to get a quote, visit kfbhealthplans.com. At Farm Credit, we partner with America's farmers who work hard each and every day to grow the food that we all enjoy. It's not an easy task, but it's an important one. Farm Credit is proud to work with farmers and ranchers, lending support in rural America. 